Welcome to the Gottesdienst crowd, where we foster confessional integrity, liturgical preservation, and preaching that doesn't stink. We believe that the historic liturgy of the divine service is more than mere cobwebs of antiquity, but it is a true treasure of the church to be dusted off and brought down from her attic to be enjoyed. So let's get dusting. Welcome back to the Gottesdienst crowd. This is Jason Broughton. Today we have back with us Dave Peterson. Welcome back, Dave. Thank you. Good to be here. We are looking at the gospel reading for the fourth Sunday after Trinity. It comes from Luke's gospel, chapter 6, verses 36 to 42. I'll read that in the ESV. Jesus said, Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher." Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. All right, um, context. This is Sermon on the Mount. Um, Do we get the whole Sermon on the Mount spread out over the church year on Sundays? I don't think so. Good question. I mean, technically, this is the Sermon on the Plain from Luke's Gospel. Right. Right. I'm just, you know, I don't care. Somebody's going to notice and put a comment. Uh, Do we get the whole thing? I don't know if Luke has the whole thing anyway. Luke doesn't even have the whole Sermon on the Mount himself, does he? No, no, because it's only... It's shorter. It's yeah. very, it's very much shor- shorter. Uh, you don't no even have woes. all the beatitudes. You don't even have all the beatitudes. Look at that. You're right. Um, I never no- never noticed that. And then there's the addition of the woes. But I mean, this right. would make sense if this is a separate sermon. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, do we get the, do we get either the the entirety of the Sermon on the Plain or of the Sermon on the Mount over the course of the Sundays mm. of the Church here? I don't know. No, I, we don't get that build house on the rock we get the tree and its fruit um the judging yeah the turning the other cheek i think that could yeah. I mean matt from luke but that's yeah mm-hmm. i think so this sermon can be divided so here's what's happened before this uh i mean this is the beginning of jesus ministry so the but he's had already the sabbath controversies called disciples healings and exorcisms Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is kind of the first big public sermon uh, that's being given, and they're there in response to these healings. The sermon, this sermon, can be divided pretty easily, I think, into three parts. We've got the Beatitudes and the corresponding woes. And then you have kind of uh, part two, I would divide into kind of further ethical stuff, how to treat people, right? Love your enemies. And and our text is the last part of that part too, how to treat people. Don't judge and condemn, but forgive and give with good measure. And then you have the parables, uh, right? So which our text is the first part of the third part with the, can the blind lead the blind and the speck in your brother's eye. But then you have, as you mentioned, the good trees and then the house built on the rock. So the pericope has been cut kind of yeah, at the end of part one and the beginning of part two mm. is the way I would see it. The um, So that judge not, so I would just take the Beatitudes as their own thing. And then you have all this stuff, right? Love your enemies, um, you know, love your enemies, and then don't judge and condemn, but forgive and be merciful, and and then give generously. And then that does seem to lead particularly into the first parable, mm-hmm. right? So I guess that's why they divided it that way. But. So how does the judging part, uh, being merciful as your father is merciful, relate to the Beatitudes and the woes put forward? 
Well, it's all in, in some ways you could sum the whole thing up with be with just be like Jesus, couldn't you? <laughs> that ev- everything he says here is be like Jesus, and and he, so what does it mean to uh, to be poor, to be hungry, to be weeping, right? And then to be hated and excluded and reviled, uh, and then you know not and then the opposite, not to be rich and so forth. I mean, in a sense, it is to not all of that could be summed up maybe broadly with don't care about the stuff of this world, care about what actually matters, mm-hmm. right? To know what's eternal as opposed to temporary. And that would be to, to be like Jesus. And then particularly then it moves to how you treat other people, right? So that you're not treating the people the way the woe is. So if it, um, so that you're not treating the people the way that Jesus is treated by those who laugh now, who are rich, who are full, and who uh, speak well. Yeah, because because the world uses people for themselves. Mm-hmm. I just heard a good. I was listening to the Art of Manliness, and there was some. It was a pretty good interview, but I can't remember what it was about. <laughs> the uh, but the guy was talking about pornography, and he was trying he was trying to pull this thing about I don't use shame. Well, I you should. But anyway, uh, he was trying to encourage people to be men and, you know, to use sexuality rightly in kind of a biblical way, but he wanted to do it without preaching the law. So that was kind of a problem. But but the things that he did say were uh, was useful. And he was talking about how human al- or, uh, pornography, right, it pulls one aspect of a woman out away from her and then uses it for the self. Mm-hmm. Right, I use it in this kind of selfish way that is ultimately destructive, and um, yeah, I mean, there's always this kind of attempt or desire to just use other people, and we do a lot more of that than I, I think, I think I do a lot more of that than I realize. Um, you know that there's, yeah, I mean, it's just we're, we're sort of it's hard to not be conscious and aware of of. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's hard to not be conscious and aware of how this benefits or affects me. Mm-hmm. You know, when my wife comes down, down the stairs and, you know, whatever's going on and the way that I respond to her and not be thinking what's in this for me, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think an awful lot of the time I'm nice to her, at least in an outward way, because, you know, the alternative is going to have consequences. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that is that is a huge distinction between us and Jesus that mm-hmm. he actually he's actually operating in love and we're often operating in first use of the law kind of kind of stuff. So so anyway, yeah, treat people the way Jesus treats you, don't treat people the way the world treats people, which is just how are they beneficial to me? Yeah. So this is kind of like what Jesus talks about in John's gospel when he says judge with righteous judgment, not according to appearance. Um, yeah, and not according to emotion either, because there are so. Uh, in my conversation with uh, Joe Rigney about uh, leadership and emotional sabotage, he talks about how there are two basic kinds of steering wheels in the world: ugly labels for true things, and ugly labels for false things. Uh, and what he means by that is they're trying to people are trying to sabotage what you say and do by labeling it in an ugly way. Uh, And one way is when they call Christians haters and bigots for condemning homosexuality. It's an ugly label for something that's true, Uh, but we shouldn't be steered by that, right? Hmm. We're not bigots and um, haters just because we say what the Bible says about something. Yeah. And then it's ugly labels for false things um, where um the, the they try to exploit um how Christians desire to be a good witness to the gospel and you know we we want to um show empathy for things and so they will um you know label you as uh you know not caring when you do things like that oh i see okay okay yeah, I was trying to figure out what is a false label for a false or an ugly label for a false thing. So it's just basically a false accusation and described in an ugly way. 
Yeah. So you're you're loving someone and they're just saying you're you're a hater. Yeah. As opposed to you're um condemning sin and they're saying you're judgmental. Yeah. And I or mean white, judgmental. Like what right, the right. what the Pharisees do to Jesus too. He they call yeah, him a drunkard okay. and a glutton. Yeah. Like he was neither of those things. Right, right, right. So they they misrepresent they they slap an ugly label either on something that's true or false. Uh, in order right. to get you to react to that, to sabotage you from yeah. moving forward. Yeah. To so stop like during you COVID, like it was, you know, if you don't require masks in your church, you just don't care about people. Yeah. You're a murderer. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a whole host of other things. Um, yeah. But things like that. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think this, you know, this whole thing, of course, the the overarching principle then would be this first sentence, to be merciful. And then and then I love this. It's not just be merciful, but be merciful in the way that your father is merciful. Okay. I, I, because I think one of the kind of problems that, so all of this could kind of be summed under that, again, be like Jesus. So, but uh, I think one of the things that this gets unmoored from is it's just be merciful. Yeah. So right? how is the and father merciful? Exactly, right? And again, I mean, I know that we harp on this all the time, but I mean, the the father is merciful within the orders of creation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's there's goodness in the orders and in the structure. And, and we are often just wanting the sort of uh, surface level of the mercy, the gift or the goodness apart from its context and apart from what God has given. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we want to be rich without working. We want to be, you know, fit without exercise. We want intercourse without marriage. I mean, on and on it goes, rather than recognizing that God's mercy comes within God's order because this is the structure and the goodness and the gifts that God gives. And his mercy is also never a kind of, is never a condoning of sins mm-hmm. or even a um, a sort of uh, what, what, capitulating to the weakness of, of our flesh. Yeah. You know, it's but, never like, look, okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I mean, this is how the atonement is accomplished, right? That, right. That you have the son being sent. That's his mercy. That's the father's mercy. But how does the son accomplish that mercy? By submitting to the father's will uh, in the law, you know, fulfilling yeah. the law, both actively and passively. Actually making the payment, actually enduring the wrath and the horror of his father's anger over the sins of the mm-hmm. world being forsaken, right? It's, it's, not a, it's not just, oh, forget about it. You know, you wrecked the car. You know, what's the consequence? Nothing. Here's another car. It's as though nothing happened. Mm-hmm. There's no lesson to be learned. There's no fruits of repentance. It's all just love, love, love. No, it's mm-hmm. somebody's got to pay for this, and Jesus does it. And yeah. Absolutely. So it's kind of like also, what is it, Galatians 6, where St. Paul says, you know, you who are spiritual, um, you know, confront or, 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 or correct your brother who has gone astray, but do it right. in, a, um, I can't remember how he says it, do it m- like mindful of God's loving kindness or something to that effect. Right. Well, I really was drawn to is that when I was preparing for this, I just I couldn't get Ephesians four out of my mind, uh, uh, because especially when he gets down into the um, you know how it is that we talk to other people, right? To be forgive as you've been forgiven, to to be merciful and to be giving to to other people the way that we've been given to, and then we have this whole thing about how in the world you go about actually rebuking your brother. And I, I mean, we've probably, all of us preachers have probably pointed this out a million times, but he doesn't say, since you have a plank in your eye, you cannot notice the speck in your brother's eye. Like I always use this, right? That's the pot calling the kettle black. Well, there's no, if the kettle's black, that's a true statement, no matter how black the pot is. Right. Right. But, but when we say that's the pot calling the kettle black, we usually mean, therefore, the pot's not allowed to notice. He has to pretend the kettle isn't black. Right. No, look, uh, that's just insanity to pretend like this isn't true. And we'll just go down together in this, you know, sinking ship. But so, uh, you know, if you, I'd, I'd almost want to read all of Ephesians four, but just, you know, it starts out with, uh, you know, a walk worthy of the calling. And then right away with, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring 
to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. This is going to require effort, right? Mm -hmm. But we are being called to actually be loving one another, gentle, right? Lowliness, that's humility, and and that there's going to be a cost, long suffering, and it's going to require effort, right? To actually keep unity. Unity doesn't maintain itself. And of course, you know, the other way to unity is just to, is to just not notice things, (laughs) but that's not what we're called to. Then a little bit further in Ephesians five, this really gets right to so much what we, what we need, right? Therefore putting away lying, let each of one, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who has need. Mm-hmm. And then, so all that about, right, there, there is actually a reform. There is a change that the gospel creates in people, then let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Those things grieve the Holy Spirit. And we are prone to every one of those things. It's so easy to be angry. It feels so good in a way to be angry, to be, to be righteous in what's, you know, your outrage over what's going on. But we're supposed to have no bitterness, no wrath, no anger, no clamor, no evil speaking, right? When we talk about these things. Now, I mean, he says earlier, be angry and do not sin. So we got both things. Don't be angry, but be angry, but don't sin there's context here and nuance, but there's a huge warning that there it's very easy to sin with words, most yeah. easy, the most damage is done. And then finally, the corrective. I know I can just feel you waiting to talk, but verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. I mean, it felt to me like Ephesians 4 feels like a sermon on like Paul's explaining what this looking at taking care of your brother looks like. Yeah, I think I think that's good. Um, almost as if what St. Paul is saying is, um, like, pay attention to your emotions. So that they're telling you something. Yeah. But don't let your emotions rule over you. So that, like, you know, he does this in Romans where, you know, he's like, um, you know, do not overcome evil with evil, but by doing good, yeah. by doing what's right. And, and so, and, by, and mostly... I'm sorry. And so what does that mean? Like, does that mean you remain silent and you never point out the evil in your midst? Um, Do you, uh, for the sake of peace, never say anything? I I don't think that's what St. Paul is saying. It's like, look, vengeance is the Lord's. He will repay, but you overcome that evil by doing what God has commanded. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think, you know, doing is mostly talking. And I think this is this is one of the things that I think we just have to I bring this up with marriage stuff all the time, but the main sins in holy marriage are eighth commandment violations. Mostly mostly we hurt each other or we love each other with words. Mm-hmm. Or by and, not you know, this, something. Well, right. Or treatment. right. Exactly. Exactly. So the the whole thing is that talking is the most important activity we have in relationships and in the church. And it's not only does it apply to, to marriages, but it's all relationships. Mm-hmm. We, we do the damage by words or lack of words, as you say, or, you know, and so to, to just kind of recognize that we need, and again, you know, for the millionth time, I think these words need to be spoken in the real world, not on the internets, you know? Oh, you mean like in flesh, yeah, to face to face with people. Mm-hmm. I mean, we need to actually be with people and then look them in the eye and talk to them and pay attention to them and recognize that this is going to require. I mean, this is this is so kind of obvious in a way, but I, I think maybe not so obvious that like Jesus recognizes that there's going to be conflict in the church, in mm-hmm. the family. And there's going to be people doing wrong. We're going to all commit sins against one another or or sins against ourselves that we need to police. 
right? I mean, we need to police one another. We need to pay attention to one another. We need to help one another. You need to see the speck in your brother's eye, Mm -hmm. but but you need to come at that speck, you know, with this spirit of humility and gentleness and concern for him. And of course, also concern for yourself that you don't fall into a greater sin and a recognition that, you know, you're not correcting him as one who, who, you know, has, has no sin, mm-hmm. but as an actual, an actual brother. So, I mean, this is the hardest thing to do, yeah. I think, in the church, in the families. Well, I, I do think that um, the advent of media, other kinds of media, has complicated it. And we haven't, yeah. we haven't as a church, uh, I think, really dealt well with just saying, okay, what are the rules? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, let's yeah. let's put down some ground rules. Like, this is in and this is out. Um, <laughs> and I, I mean, so I'm going to get charged with being a legalist, I guess. But it, it seems as though there should be some kind of thought put together, you know, like what I would do for my kids on yep. with regard to the internet. Look, do this, don't do that. And it would be nice for us to have an agreement on – all right, what are the rules? Uh, how do we make use of this wonderful thing to advance what we want to do or even to contradict the things that are false? But where does it go wrong? How does it go wrong uh, in real time and in the real world? Because otherwise it seems like, or it sounds like in some of our discussions of this, that we end up stating things that are like mutually exclusive. Like we love this new tool, but um, <laughs> like y- you can never say anything negative or, right. um, and well then who defines what's negative and by what standard is that going to be evaluated? And, and so it, it maybe it's too complicated to have rules, but it'd be nice to at least think about it at least individually well, I- what that rule is going to be. Absolutely. No, I think, you know, we just, we have such a, we have such a uh, fallen relationship with technology and this false idea that technology, we, we, we like to pretend that technology is neutral, even though it never is. Correct. But, but in fact, we, we actually believe that technology is not neutral. We think it's good. We think that advances in technology, changes in technology are, are an overall positive, right? So, I mean, I can't even tell you how many times people have explained to me that the internet helps spread the gospel. And so it's this wonderful age of living where now the gospel, like a podcast can spread the gospel and it couldn't have done it before. And we can reach people with podcasts we never could have reached, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I'm just calling foul on this. This isn't I don't believe this. I think it's false. And I think it's a complete, I think that Jesus actually came at the time of the world when the technology was the best for spreading the gospel. I think he came on purpose when he came, right? He didn't like accidentally get here early. And that's what uh, you mean by in the fullness of time. (laughs) That's right. And that the technology that was actually the best for spreading the gospel to the Gentiles was when the Roman road system existed and we relied on written words to, to, right. So, I mean, he planned this. This was the way he planted and built the church and what's happened now. So, it, but, so I think we actually think it's good. I don't think we think it's neutral. I think it's worse than, and I don't think it's neutral. I think there's always kind of a, 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 a benefit to technology, but there's always kind of limitations and weaknesses and they create numb spots in our brains or blindnesses right? Once I, once I outsource my ability to navigate to a GPS, I lose that functionality. Once I outsource my memory to a computer, I lose the ability to recall those things. Once I write all these kinds of things that we actually become less human and, mm-hmm. and becomes life more difficult. Uh, so I'm all for rules. And I think even things like, you know, and, and so But the problem is, is people are, they're terrified of losing the internet because they get so much entertainment and pleasure from it. They're Mm -hmm. addicts, they're addicts. So yes, we need rules. And this is why they resist it. Because it's hard to take, it's hard to give rules to an alcoholic about how Mm -hmm. much he can drink. He'll agree with it, but he doesn't really want to do it and he won't do it. So what would be your rules? (laughs) Uh, So, and, and I don't mean someone who's addicted. I mean, uh, 
if you were to kind of set forth kind of general um, guidelines, you know, this is third use of the law or first use of the law, you know, the curbing function. Um, what are the guidelines that like you would give to the average parishioner? I think, I think all of us need to take a fast from technology as, as sweepingly as possible and reevaluate our relationship with all of it. So I mean, cut yourself off completely for 30 days from the internet. I mean, as much as you can, you know, if, if work requires it, I mean, you've got, you know, I, I get it. You got to try to figure this out. But I think to, to divorce ourselves from all digital media mm-hmm. as much as possible for, for a fast and then figure out how much we're actually doing with it and what we're doing with it. And then I think we need to come in a very kind of deliberate way and figure out after we've had some distance what actually do we need it for or what services can it provide for us? Mm-hmm. And then which of those can we give up for the sake of mental health and spiritual health and, and, and f- family relationships and so forth. So, mm-hmm. because I think you have to recognize that we, it's not that, again, it's not, it's not that the internet, for example, is just evil, but to recognize that there's a cost to using it. And then how can I limit it? Mm-hmm. And probably it might be different for different people and it's going to depend on what your vocation is. Right. And so forth. I still have a Facebook account. I'd like to get rid of it completely, but I get photographs of grandchildren on it that I don't want to miss. And my children will only do it that way. I've asked them, can I get them another, and they're just not going to. So, you know, but I can, what I can do is though only go on Facebook maybe twice a week Mm-hmm. And then time myself so that I don't overdo it and not, I don't, and don't have Facebook on my phone yeah. and have a Facebook password that I can't remember so that it's difficult to, and don't, don't let the, uh, you know, the browser automatically fill it so that it requires effort, put mm-hmm. friction. This is all Cal Newport stuff, digital minimalism. Actually, yeah. That's what I should have said. Read the book, digital minimalism. <laughs> yeah. I've actually and, uh, taken some of his stuff to heart. Like I don't have email on my phone. Um, yeah, I took off. The br- I took the browser off. Um, yep. And I, I do when I travel, like with family, and I don't have access to my computer. Um, if I need access to my email, right? I, I put it back on. That's what I was just gonna say. Yeah. Uh, and then as soon as I'm done, I take it back yep. off. You can put it on and off. You can you can take control of this. So, but it requires. I would say even. I think one of the things I've tried with people is, I mean, really the the real weak point for us is digital stuff, right? That's where we're really kind of being destroyed. But even consider like your car. <laughs> um, you know, like cars have created commutes. I think commuting is evil. I mean, it's, it, it's, we just don't realize it yeah. because we've become accustomed to it. It's people spending two hours a day in a car, you know, on work days. Well, where does that time come from? Does your employer eat it? No, your family does every single time, right? Your employer doesn't say, look, I realize you've got, you know, you're 10 hours in the car in a 40 hour week. So, you know, come in at nine, leave at four. No, right? right. So who eats that time? You're taking that. That is a cost. That's an extreme cost. 10 hours a week that, you know, a, an automobile has maintained that has created. And then, of course, the automobile has requires maintenance mm-hmm. and uh, on and on it goes. And, you know, I'm not against automobiles, but I think that like we just accept some of these things, these kinds of modern conventions as necessary without examining them. Yeah. You know, does that make sense? Um, it's a similar thing. I mean, I mean, everybody our age, you know, I think grew up with this idea that you take the best paying job, that your whole purpose of having a job is to make as much money as possible. Mm-hmm. And you're going to go wherever the best paying job is. We never would have thought, we never thought about trying to live close to grandparents mm-hmm. or trying to live in a community that had our same values or where there was a good church. Mm-hmm. Right? Everything was about the job. I have to go where the job is. The job is the most important thing. And I mean, that I think about that now, and I think that's absolute insanity. Right. So I think there's, it's not just digital media. I think mm-hmm. digital media is the, I mean, that's the enemy at the gates. Uh, but there's, but even cars, right? Yeah, our distance from our workplace, our, you know, our distance from our 
our family, our churches, on and on. There, there's all sorts of things that yeah. were I was meaning, to. I was meaning more like when we have things like social media or blogs or even podcasts, you know, what are the rules that we're going to follow uh, in terms of um, uh, trying to keep the commandments? Like, how do we comport ourselves in those areas? What are we oh, yeah. to do? Oh. How are we to respond to someone who seems to be, uh, you know, adversarial? Uh, it, it's very easy to misread someone in, you know, short snippets and then yeah. the passions, all of the passions become inflamed. Right. Right. And the desire to show off, <clears throat> right. Mm -hmm. The desire to respond quickly, to be the first one to be funny or to, you know, get the like, or to be, you know, the insightful pundit that, you know, um, yeah, all of that is, uh, so what, what are the rules? I mean, social media, it's just very difficult to do much good there. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I have friends that disagree with me about this, but I just don't think there's this idea that like, if you don't, I just heard this recently from a really good friend, but, uh, you know, if you don't have a podcast, you don't have a voice in the world today. So, and I'm kind of like, you know, I, I, I just, I'm not going to agree with that statement. I, um, you know, that you have to use social media. It's required. Right. I mean, I th I th there are some, I mean, I think churches have to have, I think a congregation has to have, it's, it's like being in the yellow pages, you know, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there has to be some way for people to find us. And I think that makes sense. But I w <clears throat> to say we don't have a voice. <clears throat> so what are the rules? Okay. Number one, you have to have, you have to have some kind of filter blocking thing against porn. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best of those are these D and S I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm saying words I don't actually understand, but a, a <laughs> DNS server blocker, okay. uh, we have one, a pie, it's called a pie hole. It's a, it's a raspberry pie and it runs your, all the internet that comes into the house has to go through that first. So it blocks stuff. Um, and we have that, we, we haven't had it, we don't have it installed yet here, but we're going to have it here at the church too. Mm -hmm. Because even though the kids don't have any devices in the school at all, any electronic devices, I mean, people are walking in here into this building, hooking into our Wi-Fi all the time. Mm. And uh, we don't, I don't want to, I don't want them using it for wickedness. And I don't know that they never have. Yeah. Ever, you know, so, so anyway, I, I just, we just came up with this research. I was like, you know, we shouldn't be just because we don't have to worry about the kids in the school, you know, um, so I think a blocker, I th I'd say that's a rule. That's a law. You got to have, you've got to acknowledge that the internet is dangerous and full of temptation and, and you are not mature enough to just have access to it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a hard rule for me. I think uh, I would say the uh, a rule that would go with that, I'd say in probably 90% of our families, I don't know what the exact percent, but a high percentage of our families, the wife should be the one to control it. She should have the passwords to it, and uh, and the, the husband should be accountable to, to her. That seems like that's kind of shifting. It's getting worse the other direction. But uh, so those would be hard rules. And then the next thing would be a real dis like it's just like a discussion about tithing. Husband and wife should sit down together and talk about tithing and how much they give to the church or how much they give to charity, mm -hmm. right? And, and how they're going to divvy that up and how they're going to take care of it. It's part, it's a discussion that ought to be held together. And in a similar way, husband and wife ought to sit down together and talk about media consumption. Um, how many hours a week, uh, what sort of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and, on, and then you need to also then, you know, what sort of activities might, so those would be starting rules at least. Yeah. Right. Um, and then, I mean, if you want to get to how do we, I think, I think that we can expect that if you get off of social media, the less you're on it, the nicer you will be to people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do, do you have, do you think that's on, on, you think we're in the right, uh, in the right ballpark there? Do you have, you, what would you add? Well, I mean. Or do you, or uh, do you hate those? I, I don't know. I don't hate those at all. Um, we kind of have a rule at home that we're not going to you know, do any kind of internet activity alone. 
Oh, um, good one. I like and, it. And um, and I think this is uh, I think this is important. Like, uh, so that like, especially if you have an issue, like you if if you are severely tempted, you make this kind of what Cal Newport said. You make it hard on yourself. Um, and so say you've got to do stuff for work and you work from home and you need the internet and sh- you need to check your email. Well, then you got to go somewhere public that has the, what that you can access Wi-Fi. Hmm. Yeah. And then I you like check it. your email and do what you need to do there. Um, but you're not going to do it alone. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, so we don't have, we don't bring phones into the bathrooms. We, I mean, my kids only have dumb phones. Uh, that's kind of for kids. I think that's a good rule. Um, yeah, not taking your 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 phone into the bathroom is a good rule. Not taking it to the dinner table, yeah, is a good rule. Yeah, those are good rules. But I, I'm thinking also of like, okay, when we're when we are on social media because people are, um, and there is interaction. What are the rules there? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's well, where it gets more tricky and good. And maybe, maybe the, you know, I think it's like, I try to follow a rule, a personal rule to, you know, not respond too quickly to things that have upset me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if I get an email, I mean, it depends a little bit, right? You want to be responsive at, at, at certain, you know, at times and to some things, but, you know, responding in the moment, you know, in, in passion is rarely going to work out well. So if I get mm. an angry email from somebody, uh, I, I try to not respond to it. Wait, wait a day. You know, mm-hmm. you got 24 hours with an email. Yeah. You don't have to respond to emails immediately, mm-hmm. but you know, uh, even if it's something else and, you know, just to try, just to sort of uh, give myself some distance and a little bit of time and try to, I just, I just ran across a great technique. This has been working real well for me for, not obsessing over stuff. Hmm. Um, this is particularly when you're trying to go to sleep. Uh-huh. Uh, and I read about this Olympic athletes. I apparently uh, use this that, you know, they're, they got a lot on their minds that they're thinking about and they need to sleep. So they picture a, a, a bit, a hotel hallway with all the doors, nobody in the hallway, you know, just doors on both sides. And then they walk down the, the hallway in their mind and then they put in a room, whatever they, they're thinking about that they want to think about or that they know they need, you know, that I got to make sure I eat the right kind of breakfast and I hope they have enough protein, right? Uh, okay, I'm going to put that in this door in this room and I'm leaving it there till tomorrow and I go to the next one. And, and uh, it sounds dumb, but that has really been helpful to me to be able to figure out a way to kind of just walk myself through this process of letting go of these things and not obsessing over it. Mm. Uh because it doesn't do tons of good if I get a if if I if I'm upset about something or accused of something or mad at somebody, and then if I wait a day, but all I do is think about it the whole time, right? <laughs> True. So putting it in that room, you know, mentally, you know, sort sort of a mind palace kind of idea. Yeah. Putting it in that room allows me to let go. I a, a similar thing that helps me. Uh, uh, and it's more physical is to actually write it down. So I, I, I do keep a lot of lists of what I need to be doing and I'll put on this list, you know, respond to this email. Yeah. And then because I've written on the, on the list, I'm not worried about forgetting about it. So I don't have to keep thinking about it. Right. I'm yeah. going to deal with it. It hasn't been neglected. It hasn't been forgotten. It, mm-hmm. it, it's just not the time. And so that kind of, uh, you know, delaying your response on social media, I, I would think would be, one of the probably most effective rules, not yeah. responding in pat, you know, to keep yourself from responding poorly. Yeah. I know that's good. The other, the other thing would be, you know, just remember that your mother might read this, <laughs> you know, am I going to be embarrassed if my mother sees this? And uh, that's all for me, you know, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I would behave a lot better if I was, sometimes my mother does, you know, but uh yeah, I don't want my mother to see me behaving, you know, in ways that are shameful. Yeah. You know, saying, right. you know, using bad words or, you know, exact, you know, being not being nice. It's important yeah. to my mother that I, I'm supposed to, my mom thinks I'm supposed to be nice and she's ashamed when I'm not. So <laughs> she's had to endure a lot of that. <laughs> 
All right. So back to the text, um, <laughs> kind of got a, a field, but I think it's important, like in terms of like, so discussing the rules on, uh, sometimes the world has a point when they say judge not, and sometimes they yes. don't. Um, right. Sometimes, uh, because sometimes, I mean, sometimes we, we, we are bad actors ourselves, but Absolutely. it's not all the time. Um, and I wonder too, like we've talked about this before, just in terms of like tone policing. Uh, there's, there's this. I forget they call it a, like a a percentage of how it's communicated. I, I don't remember the name of it. Oh, yeah, but it's like seven fifteen fifty five rule or something like that. It all adds up to hundred percent, right. and I'm terrible at math, so I'm not going to do that. But it's like seven percent of what you want to communicate is just by the words themselves. Fifteen percent is communicated by um, uh, your tone, body language. Your, oh, yeah, and it, then fifty-five percent is like by your body language. Yeah. So, like, which is pretty closely related to tone. Yeah. 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 It's seventeen thirty-eight fifty-five. That's what it is. Okay. Seven. So the point is, is that, right. We, and we, we want to pretend like, well, the words I said were correct. Right. Therefore you can't complain. Correct. And, um, and that's the problem when in the written word is you have to be all the more careful, don't you? To ensure that you're communicating the way you ought to, or even just recognizing there are some times I've gotten emails and I'm like, I'm not going to put this in writing. Like they mm. need to hear my voice. Yeah. They need to hear like my concern or my questions and, and not misread it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I th- I think being good with words actually makes us worse at this. Um, and that is that, uh, you know, we can, you know, the, the difference between, I remember getting in trouble years ago, rightly got in trouble because I, I called something, somebody was doing a scheme, a scheme of Mm. some sort. And, and, uh, and then I was like, look, I didn't say, you know, and in fact I did. I mean, it was, that's a, that's a word that's colored. That me, that means it's not just, it has some evil intent. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we do, even with the written word, especially I think if you're, you know, if you love words and you're good with words, you can get the tone across, you can get a negative uppity, mean-spirited, arrogant tone across pretty well. I, I think I can. I, yeah. think, I think a lot of people would agree with me who have suffered my uh, misbehavior. And uh, so, I, I mean- it is more I, difficult, though, to get the opposite across. Oh, I think I, we, no, I agree. I think I agree we with are tuned yes. to the negative. Yes. And I think, no, I absolutely. But I also think that we- uh, you know, there's this temptation to be clever, to be snarky, to be mean. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even though what we're saying is technically correct. And I think so. No, I, I, so a lot of times it's not just that they might not misunderstand it. I think a lot of times it's that they will understand it. But if I was talking to them on the phone, I would be nicer. Right. Because I, it's a more human experience, and I would be more in tune to how they were receiving it, and so forth. And that's why sometimes I don't want to, because I I'm mad, and I want to I want to I want to jam a knife in their backs. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's not good. So, yeah, no, I'm agreeing with you to to not put it in writing. But I just want to say it's not just that they might mi- not misunderstand me; it's that I might behave worse. Yeah, yeah, it's both. and they might understand. And they might understand me. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> This is true. <laughs> so that that's this whole thing that it's okay. So uh, I wanted to. I I don't think we're way afield because back to that Ephesians five uh, four stuff. And again, this has to do with how we actually are dealing with people when there's a problem. He mm-hmm. has a speck in his eye. I'm not going to just tolerate it. But the hymn of the day is this Johann Hermann to uh, text. Oh God, my faithful God, mm-hmm. and it it. Uh, how familiar you are with it, but it's a great hymn. The third stanza, I just keep me from saying words that later need recalling. Guard me lest idle speech may from my lips be falling. But with when within my place, I must and ought to speak. Then to my words, give grace that I, lest I offend the weak. Yeah. 
And it's a beautiful, it's so, it's just so important. And then Lord, let this is stanza four, Lord, let me win my foes with kindly words and actions and let me find good friends for counsel and correction. Help me as you have taught to love both great and small and by your spirit's might to live in peace with all. Mm -hmm. Most of the rest of this is just, you know, regular Christian prayer kinds of things. Yeah. Forgiveness, let me die well. But I mean, that right in the middle there, and I read the um, the article by Rick Stuckwish, of all people, in this giant volume that costs a million dollars from CPH, The Companion to the Hymns. Uh, <laughs> it's a nice book. It's just too bad. It's so expensive. Um, <laughs> but uh, million dollars. <laughs> well, you know, that was just the, I mean, chi- the shipping charge. That doesn't even include. <laughs> I know. Poor CPH. They're just, you know, they're just scraping by on bread and water down there. But uh, it's a really nice. Now, book now. Can, I know. I'm, there, there we go. See? What did I, see what I just did? <laughs> Completely everything I said we, I, I don't want to do. And Herman teaches me, and then I just go and blow it. Anyway, uh, this is why you should read him and not me. And Stuckwish by the way. So Stuckwish has got a nice commentary on this text. Uh, they do give the, the background of this hymn, I'll just point out, is that uh, Herman wrote this because he had some kind of throat cancer, and oh. um, he was in a terrible place. I mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, I mean, nobody can suffer like Gerhardt, but Herman tries. It's uh, <laughs> in the middle of the Thirty Years' War, and everybody's dying, and he's got throat cancer, and he can't preach. Somebody else has to read his sermons. And there might be a he recovers, though, I think, but uh, at least slightly. But there might be some weight of that where he, he's really thinking about the power and the necessity of words from a, from a person who's tr- struggling to speak. So there you go. What is the historic epistle? Because the Elsby gives two. Uh, it's the Romans 8, 18 to okay, 23. Then. All right. Yeah, I've, our present suffering is not worthy of comparison. The the other one that they give is the Romans 12. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, which I was talking about earlier, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Mm. The whole vengeance is mine. That would be a good one for this. I could see why they put it in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't be I, haughty. I noticed the, the field test manual has a different Old Testament that... Um, LSB has Genesis 50. Mm-hmm. And where did I write it down here? I wrote it down somewhere. Oh, here we have it, uh, Isaiah 58 is the field test manual. Isaiah 58. And so, yeah, uh, Genesis 50 is Joseph, right? Forgiven his yeah, brothers. Yeah. What's, what's Isaiah uh, 50, uh, 58? I read it, but I forgot what it was already. So what what verse is the in connection? Isaiah 6 50. to 12. Okay. Yeah, is this not the fast that I've chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring your house to the poor who cast out? So being nice to people, I guess. Then you should call the Lord, he shall answer. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul. So okay. it has to do with living together again in some sense. Oh, and you shall be called. Oh, look at this. This is nice at the end of 12. For, I mean, to connect to this whole idea, uh, you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. And they capitalize that in the New King James as though it's messianic, which mm. it probably is. But, but of course, insofar as we are the right hands and mouths of Christ, it does apply to his people as well. Mm-hmm. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. Yeah, to be a repairer of the breach, restorer of streets to dwell in. So, well, doctrine's pretty straightforward, I think, right? Uh, words are powerful. Words matter. We should use them for good, not evil. Mm-hmm. We need to recognize the centrality of words for all of life and relationships. Oh, yeah, the, so, the sort of... It's always tempting to use the sticks and stones may break my bones, right? Such a, such a patently ridiculous rhyme mm-hmm. that we teach our children because we want them to stop crying. Uh, and, but, the, but it's a terrible rhyme. I, I, I advise parents not to teach it to their children because, in fact, the pain that they have from being called a name is real and it should be acknowledged, ideally. And it's probably actually in some ways worse than having a bone broken. So. Mm-hmm. 
Let's recognize the, the reality there. Well, what is the assumption that goes behind how the world uses this against Christians um, when it says ugly things about true things uh, or, or creates ugly names about true things? Like you're a hater and a bigot because you condemn yeah. homosexuality. Uh, judge not lest you also be judged. So what is the uh, the their implicit understanding of what ought to be? Is it just niceness? Is it is it the law is bad? So if the yeah. law makes me uncomfortable, then whatever makes me uncomfortable is bad. So it kind of goes back to that individualism um, and you know subjectivism. There's you know there's no universal authority. I think you're giving them way too much credit. I think it's just like the Pharisees saying Jesus has a demon. They're just, it's just pure defensiveness. It's the, you know, it's the, 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 the kettle is black. And when you point it out, he's like, oh yeah, so are you. And -hmm. therefore, right. I mean, it's just, it's just, um, willful denial of what is good because it, because it wants to remain in its sin. I don't think it's rational. I don't think it's philosophical. I don't think there's any merit, you know, there's any way to sort of understand it as well. This is their, this is because they love these things. I think it's mostly, it's just absolute hatred of the idea that, that I might have to give up this, that I'm addicted to, Mm -hmm. you know, which is pleasure or the promise of pleasure from illicit activities. And, you know, I mean, I, I really addiction it just seems like everything that has to do with addiction is so we're all addicts to sin, to idolatry, really. Mm-hmm. And the way addicts act, you know, it's, uh, I was uh, complaining, we were in Louisville for the weekend and I did, it's a beautiful city. We were downtown. I did not know that it was such a big city or that it had so many homeless people. And uh, it's, you know, just, just heartbreaking to see these people but it occurred to me in the midst of this that, you know, we call them homeless people. That's such a misnomer, you know, that that's not what's the problem. The problem is, is, isn't that they don't have a home. It's not that they don't have a house to live in. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, is there some, there's a reason, right? I mean, you know, they're, they're addicts of some sort or they're suffering severe mental illness and, uh, or, or, right. Or there's some, tr- there's something wrong that has caused them to have nowhere to go or no desire to go somewhere, right. Mm-hmm. They, they have no friends that will help them, no family that will help them. Mm-hmm. They can't go to a shelter for some reason. Right. I mean, even though there's beds there, right. So it's the, pro- we, we, like, I think when we call them homeless, we're acting like, well, what they need is a home. Mm-hmm. no, I mean, in fact, I mean, we, we do know of these kinds of experiments that have taken place. There was some place, I think it was in LA, where they, the government bought a hotel, a large hotel, and gave it over to homeless, gave everybody a room for free. Mm-hmm. And the place got destroyed um, because these people, it, so they had a place to live. They had hot water, they had heat, they had cooling, they had, you know, right? But then they ripped the, the copper pipes off the wall, you know, to to be able to sell it so that they could get money. Some of them, obviously not all of them, but right to go get money for drugs. They would rather have drugs for a few hours than to have water. Mm -hmm. I I mean, so their problem wasn't that they didn't have water. The problem was they would rather have drugs than water. That's their problem. And Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you know, we get kind of uh, waylaid by these descriptions and are then incapable of actually dealing with the real problem. Mm -hmm. You know, why are you saying demon? Um, so Adam Kuntz, we did a, a conference here at uh, my congregation last summer, and his his thesis was, you know, uh, proclaiming the 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 gospel to those who don't have hope or a home. And his point was that like people are hopeless, and so because they're hopeless, um, they don't have a home. They don't have anywhere that they dwell in. And so they they have no hope. And so they spend their time like scratching an itch that won't ever go away. Whether that's like buying yeah. things on Amazon or whatever the case is. And yeah. and this hopelessness, this this despair, 
um, as much as they want to try to distract themselves from it, they don't have a home where they actually dwell in. They just live. It's like, it's like their own houses are just hotels. And so they're just constantly trying to, they don't really exist anywhere, I guess is his point. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think, you know, then why do they say these terrible things of us? Because, because we're a threat to their, what we're saying is a threat to the way that they want to live. Mm. I'd rather walk around without shoes on my feet and sleep in and sleep outdoors and dig out of a dumpster than go without this fix. Mm. I mean, they don't, I mean, they don't, that's not everything in that person. He wants other things too, but I mean, you can't do a thing for that person when that's right. He's got a, I, it's heartbreaking. And I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not without sympathy. I mean, I'm, I'm oozing sympathy, but I just, it's such a, such more difficult of a problem than just giving them a house. And um, I think that a lot of what we're engaged in, in kind of dealing at apologetics level, I guess maybe this is what Kuntz's point is. It's like, this is not, you know, these people don't have any hope. And we're just saying, well, Jesus loves you. Here's your hope. And, and they just, you know, it's like saying, here's a place to live. And they're like, well, I do want to live there, but I want to live there, you know, with being able to be high all the time. Mm-hmm. I need to be able to, ha- I need to be able to have drugs constantly given to me. I can't work and I need money for drugs. If you will give me enough money for drugs, then, and keep me from having to work, then I will live there without tearing the place apart. Mm-hmm. You know, I, and, I mean, it's, it's like such an untenable kind of, <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So the, uh, the doctrine words are powerful. Um, but what's the correction? I mean, I think the correction, we, we, you know, of course we can't go for antinomianism. Can't be just, oh, we'll just say the words without meaning or without, you know, calls to repentance or mm-hmm. without, you know, instruction. I think the other kind of correction would be though, um, you know, this possibility of the kind of purity cult thing where we, where we do become, uh, you know, self-righteous and angry and, uh, haughty, you know, forgetting about the plank in our own eye kind of thing, Mm -hmm. rather than looking upon, you know, even our opponents within the church or within the family as, you know, those that God loves and Mm -hmm. desiring to bring them. I mean, we do need to check our motives, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Always and check our emotions. So we can't just pretend like sin doesn't matter. That doesn't make it better. Uh, At the same time, we, we can't pretend like, uh, our enemies aren't human beings whom Jesus loves. Mm -hmm. So the whole gentleness, all that stuff. Yeah. So words matter. They have to be used rightly, but then also, you know, the correction would be, we know we've used them wrongly. I think for consoling, I think this is the place I would want to go. Um, The uh, the, look, everybody, we're all in this together (laughs) and we all have problems we all have specks in our eyes and and worse. And I oh, that's the other thing. We didn't so the allegory here, right? This is a parable. It's explicitly called a parable in verse 39. So blindness here doesn't mean physical blindness. And a speck in your eye, or a, even a plank in your eye, doesn't prevent you from seeing the speck in the other person's eye, but it does prevent you from seeing clearly. And so uh so there, these are this blind is, spots. These are blind spots. There's things we don't know. And there's, and of course, the often with blind spots, we don't know we're blind to them, right? A colorblind guy doesn't know he's colorblind until he takes the test. He thinks that's the way the world is because that's what he, that's the way he experiences it. And so we all have colorblindness. Um, and there's things that we're just, our experience hasn't, and, and our training, we all have holes in our education. I mean, it's just, it's just a reality of it. And so at least we have to sort of recognize, I always kind of come back to Socrates on this. I love this because the, right, Socrates, the Oracle of Delphi says there's no one wiser than Socrates. And Socrates, like everybody else, misunderstands the Oracle and thinks that the Oracle said was that he's the wisest man in the world. But that's not what it said. It said there's no one wiser. So then he goes out and tries to find somebody wiser than himself theoretically, you know, goes around Athens bugging everybody. Uh, But ultimately, the wisdom of Socrates is that he doesn't consider himself to be wise. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it's really a delicious sort of thing. And I I think there's a real correspondence in this, that uh, the holiness of the saints, those who are forgiven, 
part of that is that they don't consider themselves to be holy. So, you know, we're not, we're not satisfied. Uh, we're, uh, we're recognizing that we, that we have these blind spots, that we have these problems, that we need constant correction from the word of God. And, and we, we want to be open to it. Uh, so, but there's a beauty in this. And I think a comfort in this, that we're all in this together, you know, Nobody, we don't need to feel inferior in that sense to the other people at church or to the other people in the ministerium or whatever it would be, uh, because we're all here by grace and we're all, we need each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, Life in the church is difficult, you know, and can, you know, we we can wish it would be easier in a sense, Mm -hmm. but, but ultimately I think the kind of encouraging thing is like, look, don't quit just because you fail. Don't, don't give up. But, you know, recognize that this is the place of forgiveness. So, you know, you slander CPH, take it back. I'm sorry. Right. I know I, there are things I don't know about, uh, millions of things I don't know about CPH or about book publishing. I was responding from pain because I actually love CPH's products. That's sincere. I do. Mm-hmm. I'm thank- this is a great book I was complaining about. And, and I'm and I'm thankful to have it, and I know it co- and I do know at a rational point that it costs a lot to produce, and has difficulties, and people suffered for it that I'm unaware of. So, look, it's easy to be snarky, and fast, and so when we are, we need to stop it, recognize it, repent, try mm-hmm. to do better. So it's kind but of we a, can. It's kind of a, a living in that um, juxtaposition of. Uh, we are declared righteous by God, and so in God's sight, we are righteous. But we are striving uh, in that new relationship with God and the new life that He has granted us in Christ um, to live up to it. Well, and I think you know this glory that we get to. I mean, that mm-hmm. sounds like, but I mean, in other, I mean, <laughs> I know that kind of. Uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. We 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 are in a church where God allows us to, and gives us the opportunity to actually start over, that he does forgive us, that we are in this together, that we are brothers, and we can reconcile. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's not like, look, you know, you, you know, you can, you can lose, you can destroy a job, you know, you, you go and, you know, say things like the kinds of things that I am prone to saying in my fallen flesh about my brothers and sisters in the office of the ministry. I mean, you do that at, you know, Bank of America about your coworkers, you're probably not going to last. And, you know, you're got, you're not, there's no forgiveness for certain things. Mm-hmm. I mean, we actually live in a community of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. My wife has forgiven me a lot of stuff. And I'm, I mean, you know, the generosity of her spirit and her willingness to, you know, encourage me to love me and, and so forth. I mean, that is a marvelous thing that I know I'm going to continue to struggle with things, but I know that I belong there, that I'm accepted there, that I'm loved there. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's right. We, as you said, right. We are defined by the grace of God. We are declared righteous. He is working in us. He wants the plank out. And so do we, and, and, and we can get it out. I mean, it's not, this Mm -hmm. isn't like some futile exercise or, or some exercise kind of fraught with, you know, landmines where if, if we, if we, if we make a mistake, that's it, it's over. You know, I'm not living in fear that my wife's going to divorce me because, you know, I behave badly sometimes. I, I fully expect confident and am rightly to expect that she's going to be gentle and kind and forgiving and, and so forth. So in the context of what Jesus is saying is a plank and a speck, what does he have in mind there? Does he have in mind um, that the father isn't merciful. I mean, that, uh, they're not being merciful the way the father is, that the law is meant, uh, as a mercy to us and as something that orders us and they see it just as a bludgeon. Yeah. And I think also a, you know, I think we're called upon here to put the best construction on other people's sins, Mm. you know, that, uh, I mean the, the plank and the spec thing is pretty exaggerated, and, you know, we're tempted to not even notice our own problems and to exaggerate the problems of others. And I think, um, you know, that's just a self-righteousness, right? So, yeah, they're not be- exactly, they're not being merciful to the Father. But the Father wants the speck gone, mm-hmm. right? He wants us to see clearly. He-, he doesn't want us to be, you know, missing things. So, so really what he's saying is 
um, see as the father sees it. Yes. So, Look upon the person with the speck with mercy, <laughs> compassion. Yeah. But not outside of the fullness of his word, law and gospel. Right. 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 Judas does not go to heaven. I mean, so, you know, the, there's not there, the, the, the mercy of God does, does not bring Judas into heaven. He, mm-hmm. The mercy of God paid for it. Uh, and, you mm-hmm. know, Judas is declared to be, you know, is, is reconciled to the father, but he does not benefit mm-hmm. from it. He's, you know, that speck is enough to take him down. I wonder if the tail end of Genesis 3 would be a, a good thing to bring in. So, you know, after the fall into sin, they cover themselves and they hear God walk in the garden, they hide. And the omniscient God asks Adam, where are you? Uh, Why are you hiding? Did you eat of the tree that I've forbidden you to eat from? Like, who told you that? Did you eat? Like, there are no accusations. There are only, Hmm. like, questions of justice, establishing fact. Interesting. So maybe maybe there's, this is how the Father deals with us. He deals with us in, in a factual basis, asking questions about what happened, what took place, before the judgment is administered. And maybe Jesus is saying, you should judge like that um, in justice and righteousness, uh, not just casting stones uh, at just to see what sticks, to see what <laughs> happened. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Well, and of course, not jockeying for position either. Right. Which, of course, obviously the father is not, right? There, mm-hmm. this, is, this is a sort of dispassionate... Right. Um, yeah. I mean, often, you know, when we're, you know, when we're engaged in some sort of spat, right. There's a, there's a desire to win. I, I wonder if this is part of the problem too, is that, um, I mean, just the fallen flesh kind of wants to see this as a zero sum game. Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. Mm-hmm. And I know there's been a lot of abuse with this kind of win, win situation sort of stuff, but There is the reality, like in holy marriage, right? I mean, this is what we're talking in the life of the church in a family. You know, there's no way that there's no way that your wife loses and you don't also lose. Mm -hmm. But there's no way she wins and you don't win. And I mean, I think sometimes too, like when the accusations are flying, it's a kind of yeah, yeah. But this does not mean that compromise is the no, no. Like right. So if I want to wear black shoes and Lauren wants me to wear brown shoes and I compromise, I'm wearing one black and one brown and that looks stupid. Right. No, I mean, I, it's uh, the father. What I meant though, is the father is coming in a kind of dispassionate factual way or God is coming to them right with these, with these statements, the seeking of justice, Mm -hmm. there's no self-interest in it. Mm -hmm. Right. He's not trying to, he's not trying to get compromise. No. He's trying to, get, and, and uh, he's not trying to, you know, lose as little as possible, or right, that 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 kind of dis, yeah, the lack of the lack of it being a power move, and he's actually concerned about them. I mean, he hasn't changed. Right. I always love to point that out. Right, he still loves them, and you know, he doesn't feel any less love for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and so it's they who have changed and who respond right poorly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So so to be merciful as the father is merciful is to, yeah. It's to not prejudge before you have the. Yeah. And and to not, and and I mean, to be willing to, or, you know, to maybe if we say it, I think probably rings easier in our ears and it's more easy to apply if we say, you know, to judge as Jesus judges or to love as Jesus loves, right? So he's willing to turn the other cheek. He's willing to be insulted. He's willing to, to do what it takes to get, to get this thing back. And, but never without, but never by compromising or pretending things don't matter. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the issue is, you know, even within the church, people have a view of Jesus that doesn't incorporate without compromising. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, that's why the whole thing is be like Jesus, right? Not, not, um, you know, not not be uh, pick the parts of Jesus that are convenient, mm-hmm. right? The the whole thing, right? The Jesus that cleanses the temple, the the Jesus that curses the fig tree, 
the Jesus that dies and rises. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Jesus that says hard things and, and also that issues, you know, parables, wisdom sayings, difficult things. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is that a way to preach this? To, to say, you know, so beginning with the fact of justification, to say, mm -hmm. and now that, you know, since we have been justified by his blood, uh, since we are a new creation in holy baptism, we have the spirit of God. We are accepted by the Father because of the Son's sacrifice. We want to be like Jesus in every yes. way that Jesus is. In every way. In yes. every way. And yes. then go describe what those ways are. And then within that context, talk about, and he also wants us to do this. Yeah. He wants us to talk to one another. And he, he recognizes that we're going to have to talk to one another in difficult, painful, and awkward situations. But mm -hmm. he wants us to talk to one another and, you know, accurately, truthfully, with gentleness, with, mm -hmm. right, without bitterness, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly what he, that is. And so in, you know, in this sense, judgment is condemnation. Yeah. In this sense, right. In this sense, so it's not I mean, just like the affirming or denying things. Right. I mean, people are all, I mean, in our context, people are always, well, we have to judge. Yes, we do. But I mean, in this context, I mean, in this, right here, it's perfectly parallel with condemning and right. And as a, as opposed to a desire to forgive, right. And to be merciful. And then, you know, I think verse 38, by the way, give, you know, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running together. I mean, I think that that's primarily has to do with giving forgiveness, giving mercy, right? Speaking the words that need to be heard. But I wouldn't limit it to that at all. I think this is also a, a call to hospitality again, to share with one another. In so, okay. Any final thoughts? I mean, I know. Yeah, <laughs> that that'll be it. That'll be my final thought. That this. Uh, what did I just say? That this is a. Uh, uh, also has something to do with hospitality. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Dave. We'll pick up uh, next week with uh, Trinity 5. All right. Thank you. Thank you.